Additionally, to maintain artificially low food prices, we force the producers of food to come up with easy to produce products that are also of necessity lower quality. That's, that's just, that's the impetus that drives uh, competition in the marketplace. In today's world, higher productivity with lower cost means mechanization. And that means technological solutions, and in this case, to a very biological problem. So, how did we get here? <clears throat> you saw this picture a little earlier, I think. 70 years ago, World War II had just ended and two revolutions occurred in farming. And by the way, to the delight of farmers everywhere. First, artificial fertilizer was introduced as a result of the nitrogen compounds that were left over from the production of munitions during the war. <clears throat> Food production was greatly increased as a result of fertilizers. Second, synthetic pesticides were introduced, specifically DDT and DDE. DDT was widely used for uh, terrestrial applications. DDE was used for aquatic applications. Uh, and that was to confront the growing problem with agricultural pests. <clears throat> pesticides and fertilizers had immediate effects on farms. Sometimes within a single year, the effects of pesticide overuse could be seen. The first year, a pound of DDT might completely wipe out uh, a target pest, but within, by the second year, maybe two pounds were necessary. Within five years, 10 pounds might be necessary, but only half of the insects were dying. The biological reason was clear. Insects were adapting to the toxins. That wasn't, by the way, a mystery to anybody. Um, all scientists, eco ecologists and evolutionary biologists knew that. Mutations for resistance to the toxins were being favored. The survivors, were producing offspring that were also resistant, and insect populations were shifting rapidly and were much less susceptible. In agriculture, the underlying reason for this increased amount of pesticides that was needed to kill each succeeding generation of the crop pest, this was very clear by the 1950s. DDT had lost its effectiveness by 1955 in many agricultural applications, particularly cotton. We understood how natural selection worked, but the response by humans to that understanding was somewhat less logical. The effectiveness of the toxins was decreasing because resistance in the insects was increasing, but the so-called solution was to make better and more powerful pesticides. The illogical part, of course, was the implication that this resistance was either not going to happen a second time or a third time or a thousandth time, <clears throat> Or the assumption was that creating new toxins could just be repeated indefinitely. Neither of those were true, and we should have known it. With an accurate understanding of evolutionary biology, the most important lesson was this. Chemicals select for their own obsolescence. Each and every toxin will locate every mutation for resistance and it will offer that mutation unlimited success. This is very much like reading child, the children's books, Where's Waldo? Every large population of insects, or any pest, has a Waldo mutation. And the chemical can find that mutation immediately. The stronger the chemical, the faster it will find it. A pesticide kills all of the insects that are susceptible and the only ones still living are in some way resistant or tolerant of the pesticide. This finding of the mutation is no more difficult than just finding the living insects. There it is. An important corollary is this. The harder we hit the pests, the faster we'll find that mutation for resistance. The more we kill, the more we encourage resistance to emerge. Now, there's a definite aspect of irony to this. If a toxin kills only 50% of the pests, we can't always be sure why 50% of them lived. There could be a lot of different reasons when half of them survive. Their offspring may or may not be resistant to the herbicide or pesticide or insecticide. But if 99.999% of them die, the survivors are alive for only one reason. They are resistant, and the offspring of those will also be resistant. In a population of a billion insects, 99.999% dead still leaves 10,000 alive. And those 10,000 
will take over. And they'll take over very quickly. In other words, the technological solution of making better and more powerful pesticides to kill more completely helps us arrive at this conclusion. The harder we hit them, the faster we're going to lose the fight. No living insect has ever failed at this game. All insects are faced with chemical challenges because the majority of insects eat plants. And all plants defend themselves from, in, to, from insects with chemicals. All plants produce toxins to fend off would-be herbivores. All would-be herbivores have adapted to these toxins or they wouldn't be here today. When we apply chemicals to crops in the hopes of killing our pests, we're challenging them to do the one thing that they do better than anything else, and that is cope with chemical stress. As biological entities, they are capable of adapting to the chemical stresses in their environment and in a short amount of time. And the more powerful the chemical, the shorter the amount of time that's needed to adapt. These are the rules of evolutionary biology. They've been spelled out for decades. We've known this since well before we started applying artificial um, pesticides to our crops. Here's the bottom line, though. <clears throat> biological systems adapt to stress, and it doesn't matter if the stress is biological or technological. It's just a stress. They adapt. But technological solutions cannot adapt in return. They're fixed. They're not living. They do not respond to changes in the environment. And modern agriculture has attempted to convert food production to a technological process. But growing food remains a biological process. We're attempting to solve the biological problem of food production by applying technological solutions. The pests that bedevil farmers are biological problems. They can adapt to the technology, but the technology cannot adapt to them. As each technological tool fails, it must be replaced with another newer technological fix. And by the way, that one will fail also. This is the technological treadmill. Farmers are caught on this treadmill, but for them it's called a chemical treadmill, chemical solution treadmill. They're dependent on the cleverness of the tech world <clears throat> to solve their problems because the modern farm has been so damaged by chemicals um, that it's lost the ability to respond on its own. The soils are nearly dead or with very low biological diversity. Helpful insects like ladybugs and insect-eating birds are gone because of toxicity in the environment or just loss of habitat in general. Seventy years of chemicals have chased farms into the greenhouse, away from the soil, away from nature, and even more towards technology as the savior of food production. Now, we love technology. We love new technology, but we rarely understand it thoroughly. Rapid application of a new technology is exhilarating, and it's typically like a sweepstakes. The first company to use it is going to be the biggest economic winner. Technological breakthroughs are often applied as soon as possible, but very often without a clear understanding of long-term consequences. There's a term for one action that causes many effects, and that's pleiotropy in the genetic world. When one gene is influenced, but a multitude of effects uh, occur as a response to that manipulation, that's pleiotropy. Over time, with technology, we learn that there are um, <clears throat> often secondary effects or indirect effects or just plain unpredictable effects that result from the technologies. We often make initial assumptions about the impact of technology that laid out to be, turn out to be <clears throat> pretty simplistic, naive, uh, or just plain poorly thought out. The consequences of DDT on the environment, great example. For a temporary reduction in pest abundance, we were also rewarded with pesticide resistance, ecosystem collapse through the loss of beneficial species, magnification of DDT up the food chain, and long-lasting deleterious effects of the environment overall. And biotechnology is the latest technological toy. We're like a child playing with an apparently unloaded gun. We have discovered how to genetically modify an organism with the intent of improving some single aspect of it, 
but we're applying that technology to a very complex biological system. And we know that it is not possible to modify a single variable in a system without influencing every other variable in that system. We have literally no appreciation of the long-term effects that might follow. What I can tell you this, though, is that biotech is nothing more than a new, more ingenious technological solution to that biological problem of producing food. And the pests are the targets of the biotech cleverness. And they're going to adapt to this technology just as they did to the old technology. So there you go. That's my soapbox speech. Mm -hmm.